In today's lecture, we're going to talk about uh, streaming. And many of you have already been introduced to streaming um, in our project discussions. Uh, some of you have presented problems uh, based on streaming. So I presume this is not very new to you. So um, largely going to jump right into the topic. But I thought um, I'll uh, talk a little bit about the first time I came to know about streaming. This was uh, several years ago, uh, to be precise. Uh, it was actually SODA 2003. And uh, this notion of streaming, uh, the topic of streaming, was introduced uh, um, by the plenary speaker uh, of uh, SODA 2003, who was uh, Muthu Muthukrishnan, uh, pictured here. Um, a very interesting personality, uh, I believe. I haven't really met him uh, uh, face to face, but I've seen him several times. Uh, uh, you know, excellent speaker. And uh, one characteristic about him is I, every time I see him, um, he has a different hairstyle, a different hair color. Um, so, anyway, this is how he introduced uh, streaming. You are standing, uh, you, you know, on a stream or by the, by a stream, and you see different types of fish go by. And his, uh, his so he introduced the notion of streaming as you know you see all these fish going by, and uh, uh, you have some questions in your mind about the fish. But unfortunately, you cannot catch and store all the fish, so you have to let the let the fish go by. And then you, at the end of the day, after a long day of you know fishing, you have some questions about the type of fish that you saw, uh, the biggest fish, the smallest fish, the average size, and you know that's just to get us started. And then many, many such questions. And um, uh, so this is the kind of colorful perspective with which uh, uh, I was introduced to uh, streaming. So without further ado, let's. Uh, get started. Let me introduce the streaming model. So the data flows as a stream and you get to see data one at a, one item at a time. And here you are looking at the data and each time you get to see one data item. And let's uh, give ourselves some notations. So let's say the data items start from A1, A2. You're currently looking at AI and so on. And the data stream keeps coming in at every time step. And um, you don't get to store the entire data. At each point in time, you can do some temporary computation, which we don't really care about how much uh, computation we do. But the essential thing we do is that we have some sort of a um, a synopsis or a sketch that we uh, maintain. Okay? And typically, this synopsis or sketch is going to be much smaller than the size of the stream. So we don't assume that we know the size of the stream. So this 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 quantity is an unknown. And however, um, the uh, synopsis itself has is assumed to be very very small and typically little o of n, uh, often as small as o of log n o of uh, square root of n. In fact, we're going to see one example where um, we only use o of uh, log log n uh, space. Um, so with this, uh, let's uh, jump into um, an, uh, a problem. Uh, let's say that we are getting a steady stream of items, and we don't even know uh, how many items there are in the stream. But we want to count the number of items. And this is, of course, quite easy, because all we need is a, a counter of O of log n bits. And in fact, with a counter of O of log n bits, uh, we can um, count n uh, accurately. Uh, the challenge is what happens, what ha think of a situation where um, the number n is very large and you want to uh, count using very few number of bits. And this could happen in cases uh, like embedded systems that see a lot of data 
but their design is uh, they're designed to be working with such resource constraint uh, context that uh, memory is at uh, is at a premium um, and so in situations like this it it's interesting that we can actually get a rough estimate of uh, the number of items with far fewer number of bits in fact uh, what we're going to see now is a way to estimate n um, within uh, an epsilon uh, fraction so in other words we're going to get an estimate n hat that's going to belong to n minus epsilon n and n plus epsilon n we're going to be able to give this guarantee with a probability at least 1 minus delta. And such an approximation is called an epsilon delta approximation. And believe it or not, uh, this problem was actually studied way back in the 70s. And in, that, in some sense, it's not very surprising because memory was a lot more expensive back then. And so it was important to design uh, algorithms of this nature uh, even back then. Uh, but I don't think the author realized how uh, important and fundamental these ideas are going to be and how they're going to lead to um, very interesting uh, work uh, starting from the late 90s uh, and 2000s and onward. Um, so this, uh, the algorithm that we're going to study uh, was introduced by uh, Morris and later it was analyzed uh, by uh, Flyolet in the mid 80s. Um, so here's how this uh, algorithm goes. We initialize a variable x uh, to 0 and each time we uh, see a data item we update x with some probability. So in particular whenever we see a new item uh, we f flip a biased coin and with bias uh, 2 to the minus x. And remember x uh, uh, is uh, a value that's going to be uh, incremented over time. If this bias point comes up with a heads then that's going to happen with probability 2 to the minus x then we increment uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, quantity x. At the end of the stream when we come to the very end of the stream and now we need to know how many items we've seen we simply output 2 to the x minus 1. And why is this even correct? I mean, why? what is the intuition behind this algorithm, you may wonder. Um, so what's going on is, uh, is the following. We start off with x equal to 0. First time we see an item, our x is going to be a 1. And then subsequently, with probability half, roughly speaking, you are going to increment in the next couple of uh, occasions so that would would lead us to so this is items one two three four eight now as you can see when we see the second and third item with probability half intuitively speaking we would uh, increment so by the time we come to a four we would have probably reached uh, Account, um, x value would have reached 2. Between 4 up to 7 you would be incrementing with probability uh, 2 raised to the minus 2 so with 1 fourth probability so between this range you expect to increment by 1 uh, and then between 8 and 15 you again hope to increment by 1 and from 16 to 31 you will increment by 1 on expectation and so on and so forth so so every time the numbers double you increment once this the rate at which we increment is logarithmic and the number of bits we need to store the um, the counter is only log of log n so that's the intuition uh, but let's look at it a little bit more um, carefully and more formally so the claim we would like to prove is that uh, the expectation of the random variable 2 to the x is uh, n plus 1. 
and this is why uh, we output not to the x but to the x minus 1 so we output um, n um, so the question is why is this uh, claim uh, true so let um, x n be the value of x um, after seeing item n so uh, now the expectation of 2 to the x can be written in this way it's the uh, summation of i going from 1 to infinity probability that x n minus 1 equal to i times uh, now given that x n minus 1 equal to i you want the expectation of uh, 2 to the x uh, n um, so in case you are wondering uh, where this comes from you can uh, refer to Mitzenmacher and Ufal, page number 27 so, uh, that'll be a, a good reference for you to verify this uh, formula okay so now we have the summation of, uh, of the overall i, the probabilities of xn minus 1 uh, times, and now we need to expand out the expectation, this conditional expectation that we have here. Um, of course, this 2 to the xn, remember, um, we're conditioning on xn minus 1 equal to i. And if you know that xn minus 1 equal to i, then from the algorithm um, we know that we're going to increment with probability 2 to the minus i and stay uh, the same with probability 1 minus 2 to the minus i which is exactly what is uh, given here in this formula so with one um, or I'm getting my i's and j's mixed up so let's call this i's so with probability 1 over 2 to the i, uh, we have, uh, we're going to increment. So uh, 2 to the xn will become 2 to the i plus 1. And with the remaining probability, it will stay 2 to the i. Okay, so let's uh, expand this out. And uh, with a few um, cancellations, we're going to get the summation of the probabilities times uh, 1 plus 2 raised to the I. When we take the summation uh, inside the parentheses, now this is going to be two uh, summations. Um, the first summation is just going to be one because it's uh, summation over all possible probabilities of a probability space. And the other uh, summation of this one let's uh, look at this a bit carefully so this is going to be nothing but the expectation of 2 to the x n minus 1 okay so this is nothing but 1 plus the expectation of uh, 2 to the x n minus 1 and so now uh, what we have is some um, uh, recurrence that we can expand out so it's going to become 1 plus 1 plus e to the 2 and this can be expanded out and we will finally get n minus 1 plus the expectation of 2 to the x1 but x1 is uh, is is always one, and therefore the expectation uh, of two to the one is going to be just two, and that's going to evaluate to n plus one, which is exactly what we wanted. So here is a quick exercise for you. Um, this is uh, just to give you some context this exercise is um, designed to move us towards an understanding of the variance of uh, this random variable x uh, we want to show that the expectation of uh, 2 to the 2x which is essentially the expectation of 2 to the x uh, squared 
um, uh, goes up to theta of n squared and uh, uh, so you can show this using the same technique that we used to show the expectation of 2 to the x. And the implication of uh, this exercise is that the variance of uh, 2 to the x is um, equal to theta of n squared. And when the variance is theta of n squared, the standard deviation is of the order of n and um, if you work out the math this is not going to be a reasonable approach to get a good epsilon delta approximation so we need to be a bit more careful here so this is a good uh, starting point but uh, in order to get a good epsilon delta approximation uh, what we're going to do is not just have one estimate but several estimates and then take the average and we'll see that by doing that we can bring down the, uh, uh, the standard deviation of the estimate uh, to a, a point where we get the appropriate epsilon delta approximation so i'm going to call this algorithm uh, modus uh, plus plus because it's one step um, uh, uh, it's a one step improvement over the classic um, modus algorithm in this, uh, we have a parameter t, and that's um, parameter is going to be of uh, theta of one over epsilon squared delta. Uh, the exact constants uh, can be worked out in the analysis. So here's how we're going to uh, do this. So we're going to maintain uh, t. Um, variables. We're going to call them x1, x2, and so on up to xt, and we're going to initialize all of them to zero. So this is essentially uh, implementing Morris's algorithm in parallel. As each item arrives, we execute the following line in parallel. Uh, for each value of i ranging from uh, 1 to t uh, and we do this independently so when uh, for any given value of i with probability 2 raised to the minus xi so it only uh, uses the random uh, the variable xi with probability 2 to the minus xi we increment xi so these are the, the um, the variables x1, x2, uh, up to xt are uh, manipulated completely independent of each other. Okay, but at the end, when the stream ends, we simply output the uh, average of the estimates. So when the stream ends, we simply return one plus the average uh, of uh, two to the xi. So let's uh, analyze this uh, Morris++ plus plus algorithm. Let's use Z uh, to denote um, the average value of 2 to the x uh, i's, uh, which is essentially 1 over t, summation 1 to t, uh, 2 to the x i. So the first question is, what is the expectation of this uh, Z? Well. The expectation of each of the 2 to the xi we know is, is n plus 1, and you sum them up and divide by t, so that's essentially going to be n plus 1. So there's no change there. So we're still going to get a good estimate, uh, well, with the correct expectation, but hopefully the standard deviation has improved. So let's see how we can show that. Um, so for that, we'll have to look at the variance of z. So we first simply expand out z. So this is what uh, shows up here. Now of course we can bring the uh, t outside the variance and that gets um, squared when we bring out a, t um, a constant term outside of the uh, of variance. And moreover the variance of each of the 2 to the x i's is, 
is equal to each other and so this is um, the summation is really summation over equal variance terms so uh, that uh, and it's summed from i equal to 1 to t so that t can be brought out as well so it becomes 1 by t variance of uh, 2 to the x um, and of course we know that the variance of 2 to the x is uh, some theta of n squared you should have worked it out as an exercise so if that uh, is the case then this variance becomes theta of n squared divided by t so as we increase t we can get uh, um, better variance so now assuming n is uh, sufficiently large look at the probability uh, that this random variable z is um, is far away from n. So in particular, um, z minus n minus 1, remember the expectation of z is equal to n plus 1. So the probability that z minus the expectation of uh, z is greater than uh, epsilon n is at most the variance of uh, z over epsilon square n squared and of course this um, comes uh, by Chebyshev's inequality so applying uh, our knowledge of the variance of z we get theta of n squared over t uh, times 1 over epsilon square n squared so now the question is um, well we we have we know that t is theta of uh, 1 over epsilon square uh, delta for suitable uh, constants. So if we substitute that, um, some of the uh, terms are going to get uh, canceled out and this probability can be brought down to delta for a suitable choice of uh, constants. So just to uh, conclude this, each execution of the Morris uh, algorithm will require log log n bits but we repeat it t times where t is theta of uh, 1 over uh, epsilon squared delta so our total memory is uh, theta of log log n divided by epsilon squared delta so now here's an exercise for you extend this uh, um, modest plus plus algorithm uh, in order to achieve um, a memory requirement of only log 1 over delta times log log n divided by epsilon squared so instead of essentially instead of a 1 over delta term we're going to have a log 1 over delta so that's a pretty significant uh, improvement as a hint please note that um, you will have to use the Chernoff bound to achieve this uh, uh, this bound.